And it's my great pleasure now to introduce Joe Chambers. He's a prolific writer and a former employee who started his NASA career in the full-scale tunnel. Uh, and then he became manager of it. He retired from NASA Langley after 36 years as the Systems Analysis Division Director and, uh, and after many, many years of research in civil and military aeronautics. So we'd like to join me in welcoming back uh, Joe Chambers. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, gosh, what a thrill to look around and see all the, the peers and people that uh, wrote the history of this remarkable wind tunnel. Uh, it is an absolute honor to be able to speak to you this afternoon about this facility. Uh, it's legendary. Uh, many of you, particularly wise, may not realize it, but the magazines, the books, the television documentaries, uh, the sights and sounds of aircraft you see flying over the peninsula today were all touched by the people and the work that was done in this particular facility. Uh, I counted up, as of this date, 796 tests of different airplanes were conducted in this facility. And uh, the public's first question is usually, why did NASA need more than one wind tunnel? Well, that's part of the story I want to tell today, how this thing was birthed and why it was birthed and the importance of what was done there. Uh, what I'm going to try and do this afternoon is give an appropriate level presentation so the wives will understand what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not going to use any equations that you don't understand, and more importantly, I don't understand. Uh, but I am going to use photographs and some old movie clips, uh, and some of you that have worked full scale will see for the first time of things that happened in this facility that, frankly, I didn't know about until I did research on it as well. Uh, Basically, what my outline is, I'm going to cover the, the background and the birthing of this facility, uh, talk about its extremely significant contributions in terms of photographs and movies, and at the end, I'd like to go back to Lisa's comment about the people. We're going to talk about the personnel and the culture uh, that was evident in the operation of this facility. So, with that background in mind, let's start a little bit about history and grab my hand now as we go back into the, the 1915 era, no less and talk about how this tunnel came to pass. <clears throat> okay. Let's get oriented first. Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with the area, uh, you are here, as they say, in the shopping malls in the uh, western, west area of NASA. Uh, what we're going to talk about is the so-called East Area of NASA, where it all began with a, an organization called the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. 1915, the United States realized it was very far behind Europeans in the development of aircraft and uh, commissioned a group of 12 men, a uh, combination of military, government, and others, to help organize and orchestrate the problems of flight and advance aircraft. They were given no salary. They were given a grand total of $5,000 to operate with and told to go do the job. Well, after much hassling and fighting amongst themselves, uh, the military and the government, it was decided to settle at uh, what would be Langley Field near Hampton, and therefore they were able to uh, obtain this amount of uh, land to build the, the center and begin operations. This is what the laboratory, the NACA Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory looked like in 1924. You see here the uh, administration building, which had been de dedicated in 1920 with a flyby of 25 old biplane Keystone bombers led by General Billy Mitchell as an overflight the day of dedication. Uh, and in the early days of construction, there wasn't enough housing in the area. Actually, some of the earlier workers had to live in this building uh, during the early construction period. Now, what I want to talk about is how this wind tunnel evolved, and, it, and its dependence came about because of three other wind tunnels that were at Langley. They're still, these buildings, by the way, are still at Langley. Uh, Dodd Boulevard, uh, current day Dodd Boulevard, passes in the front of this building. The building here housed the first wind tunnel that the NACA built. The second building you see there was a very special tunnel called the Variable Density Tunnel. Ironically, that the remains of that facility are less than 50 yards away from us right now outside this building on display. Uh, if you haven't seen it or heard about its history, please take a look on your way out later today. But I'd like to go through how these wind tunnels and one other 
led to the development of the full-scale tunnel. Wind tunnel number one was a copy of a British wind tunnel, a 10-year-old design, and it was basically obsolete before it even got into operation. This was the last time that this research center was not in the forefront of lead in wind tunnel technology. Uh, the tunnel had a five-foot diameter test section. It had to work, of course, with very small models uh, of biplanes in those days. Uh, and the initial results that came in, uh, NACA had borrowed two Curtis Jennies for flight testing over on the Langley side. And the initial results for critical uh, performance information like cruise speed and landing speed were not predicted very well by this wind tunnel. So uh, it was ruled a, a failure, a lot of dismay, and other wind tunnels took, took the four. Brilliant aerodynamicist here at Langley came up with the second tunnel, which made its mark in history and frankly put this research center on the map as far as aerodynamic testing was concerned. This was the so-called variable density wind tunnel. And uh, ladies, I'm going to try and explain this in unscientific but hopefully understandable terms. The issue was how to test a small scale model of an aircraft in the atmosphere and make it resemble that of a full scale airplane flying in the atmosphere. And the problem was basically, if you think about it in this unscientific way, consider the molecular structure of air and its properties, and you inject a very small object, like a small model airplane, not very realistic compared to a large airplane compared to the size of those molecules. The idea was, let's build a wind tunnel and pressurize the air. And in so doing, we might be able to take a 1 20th scale version of an airplane, pressurize this tank to 20 atmospheres, and come out with something that approached full-scale conditions. That was the basic concept between, behind the uh, variable density tunnel. Pressurized shell, a wind tunnel within that shell, uh, and oh, again, a five-foot diameter test section, but the ability to pressurize it up to 20 atmospheres. And indeed, when they ran these tests, and airfoils were their primary objective in their testing procedure, they got world-class data, and the entire world stopped the aeronautical research world stopped and said, Langley Center is where the action is. Very promising. Uh, it became a national landmark, uh, won uh, several awards for its major contributions. Again, I'd, I'd refer you to look at it on your way out this afternoon. However, it did have two problems. Number one, it was a very small test section. And the people that conducted flight tests said, well, how are you going to represent the guide wires, the, the uh, bracing wires on biplanes. What about the fabric of the wings that were being flown in those days? How are you going to represent that on these small models? The other big factor was turbulence. This wind tunnel was so short, 35 feet long, that it had very high turbulence factor. In fact, the, one of the highest in the world. And uh, that resolved itself in later years. But nonetheless, immediately a feud grew up at Langley about full-scale airplane flight testing versus wind tunnel testing and subscale model testing. Now, some of this was alleviated when Langley put into operation a third wind tunnel. This was a so-called propeller research tunnel, and it was stimulated by a Navy directive that a full-scale test of propellers was in order. Uh, these smaller wind tunnels couldn't handle propeller testing very well, so Langley built a 20-foot diameter wind tunnel powered by a single propeller, and as you can see, uh, actual airplanes were put in, in some cases, outside with the wings outside the airstream. But all the action happened to be up in the propeller area. And a major objective was to reduce the drag caused by air-cooled engines. And the concept came about of what was called the NACA cowling, which won Langley, one of its coveted Collier Awards, as uh, the most significant accomplishment in aviation. That concept was immediately put into operation on aircraft like the DC-3 and virtually every aircraft of that era. The press were super enthusiastic. The entire 19, late 1920s as a result of these tests became a, a boiling point for aeronautics. And the NACA was very fortunate in having an individual named George W. Lewis be its director of research. Uh, Lewis was an engine man. But he loved research, and he was the epitome of a manager from a researcher's perspective. He was transparent, yet he knew everyone in Congress, he knew everyone in the military, and he loved his people. In fact, he referred to the Langley people as, quote, his boys. Uh, he was invited to station himself at Langley 
deferred and said, I want to be in Washington where I can get the job done and stay out of the way. A wonderful man, it, it, my personal opinion, it was a shame that the Langley name came about from the politics of the day because Lewis was the guy who meant most of the NACA and to Langley in particular. Uh, he caught on to the rumors about and the possibility of building a full-scale wind tunnel. Let's test a real airplane rather than these small models. He was excited. He was electric with that idea, and he personally sold Congress on the idea of building this tunnel. Now, with the coupling of Charles Lindbergh's flight, 27, and in the 29 time frame, he was able to gather the funding to build the full-scale tunnel. Leave you with one thought about Lewis. He loved this center so much that when he died, he willed that his body be cremated and scattered over Langley. And in 1948, that event happened. Now, to the right, you'll see that once uh, Lewis had procured the, the funding required to build this tunnel, the first staff was recruited. And a couple of people I'd like for you to recognize in this picture. The gentleman with a pipe in his hand is Smith de France. He was the designer of the full-scale wind tunnel. Uh, and he also did very important things at other centers that we'll talk about a little bit later. To his right is Clint Dearborn, who one time became the full-scale tunnel branch chief. This is Abe Silverstein, who became director of uh, NACA and NASA Lewis later in his career. There were a, a powerful no amount of very important people that worked on that initial staff at Langley. And again, I'll come back to them in a minute. Not shown here is the staff of technicians and mechanics that worked the facility. Uh, but they were as equally as important in what they had accomplished in the facility as well. Now, the vision that they had uh, was shown on the left. A full-scale wind tunnel capable of testing airplanes in their vision, uh, current and in the future. And again, I remind you, we're talking biplanes when this all started. Uh, a wind tunnel that would measure 60 feet across, 30 feet high, be capable of speeds of a little over 100 miles an hour, and uh, in their minds at least would be able to test aircraft for decades to come. Uh, the layout was such that the test section of the wind tunnel had no walls. This was a, a, a concept that Eiffel, yes, the same guy that built the Eiffel Tower, had in mind uh, to minimize the effect of tunnel walls on the airflow through the tunnel. So the tunnel was set up to be powered by two 35 and a half foot diameter propellers, each driven by a 4,000 horsepower motor, and was what is called a closed return, open throat tunnel. The air came through the test section, went through guide vanes through the building, and came back through the walls of the building to recirculate and minimize the energy expenditure to, to have the flow through there. Uh, it was a huge task. Uh, no one had ever built a two propeller type layout for a wind tunnel. Uh, and there were a tremendous tasks to be had in terms of determining the right structure. Now, I want to point out here on this cross-sectional view, you can see the tunnel airflow circuit and the return passage. Please note that there was a considerable area underneath the air circuit because there were some things that happened in that area historically that are very important and have historically been overlooked, which I'm going to mention today. Uh, to lay out the tunnel, of course, uh, there were major issues about what should the return passages look like, uh, how to configure the tunnel. So a model tunnel was built in 1929, and testing was done to uh, basically verify the lines and, and what they wanted done. This shows a test underway in 1929. By the way, this model tunnel is still over at full-scale wind tunnel today. In the 50s, it was given to Portugal for research purposes, but it's still back over the tunnel today. Uh, testing was underway, and uh, with that vision, they continued to, to go into the construction phase of the tunnel in the 1930s. One of the major issues they had to face was how are we going to build this wind tunnel, this huge structure uh, equal to a football field length and a half. Uh, what's it going to be constructed of and what can we afford to construct it with? Uh, at that time, the Army, uh, Army Air Service was operating an airship hangar here at Langley. I'll show you another picture of it in the next couple of charts. A huge structure. It was it's bigger than the full-scale tunnel is today. But it was the home for the airship Roma and a number of famous balloons that the Army was flying at that time. It was constructed of asbestos concrete sheets, which gave extraordinary strength and was very low cost and, and required no maintenance. So the NACA engineering staff decided to adapt that for the uh, construction of the full-scale tunnel. 
This is an advertisement that showed up in the Saturday Evening Post in the 1930s by a company, Philip Carey Products, and they produced a corrugated asbestos sheet known as Carey Stone, uh, which was adopted for the construction of the full-scale wind tunnel. Uh, the cost of the tunnel was, in fact, ultimately about $980,000. It was during the Depression era, and, and much has been said about the fact they got a very good deal when we think about building something like this today for less than a million dollars. But I want to point out one thing about this facility. In truth, this wind tunnel cost three times the investment that the NACA had made in all of its laboratory here at Langley. The cost of three labs buildings, wind tunnel number one, the variable density tunnel, hangars for their airplane, three times the cost of everything they had invested. So it was a big gamble for the NACA to build this wind tunnel. This shows the construction, and in this picture you can see the men hanging up the carry stone sheets on the outside of, inside, excuse me, of the building. The building was built inside out since the return passages uh, and the air return passage were in the inside of the building, it had to be smooth. The outside is where all the steel structure, et cetera, went to support the building. So this is a picture taken in 1930. Uh, J.A. Jones Construction of Charlotte, North Carolina, where the people that uh, built the tunnel. And <clears throat> on May the 27th, 1931, George Lewis dedicated the full-scale wind tunnel. By the way, he also uh, had Admiral David Taylor with him from the Navy, who was uh, of an equal stature in the development of the first towing tank here at Langley, which did research on seaplanes. So on the same day, there was a magnificent dedication ceremony for both the full-scale tunnel and the towing facility. <clears throat> this shows an aerial view a few years later, but it, it gets across what the area looked like when these facilities were put in. Uh, this is Hampton up at the top, the back river here. Here's the King Street Gate coming over to the Langley area and the full-scale tunnel. Down here, you see that huge airship hangar that I was talking about, which was in, in uh, that area, along with hydrogen and helium plants here until 1947 when it was torn down. This is the temporary Air Force hang, uh, housing area right now. But this gives you a view of what the, what the uh, facility did to the landscape of Langley at that time. The first test was scheduled for the tunnel in 1931. This was a uh, bit of a staged photograph. Uh, George Lewis wanted an airplane in that tunnel and something tested as soon as, as they could get it in. So a Vought Corsair biplane was put in in June of 1931. You can see the, uh, the balances that were used in the tunnel. These are Toledo scales, just like we all have in our bathrooms, uh, to measure the air loads that were acting on this airplane through a support truss structure. Uh, this test lasted only nine days. It was done for publicity and picture taken and to get some preliminary data. I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, number one, you can see the guys down here with the Toledo scales. If you look carefully, you can see a, a, a mechanic up in the cockpit. That, in those days, that was one of the mechanic's uh, uh, duties, was to get in the airplanes, power them up, or do whatever they had to be done during a test. And then if you look over to the right side of the tunnel, you see a gentleman over there. He was controlling the airspeed of the tunnel. And there was actually a, a stepper switch similar to a streetcar uh, a wooden handle switch that was used to change the airspeeds within the tunnel uh, for years. So the tunnel went into operation and uh, glory be when the first tests came back and were com compared to flight testing, the results were almost identical to flight. And uh, the excitement about this new facility and the fact that it could uh, reliably predict airplane characteristics generated a, a great deal of interest within the uh, aviation community. Uh, spirits were beginning to, to rise uh, it was unstoppable in terms of world publicity. Then, in 1933, uh, in August, there was reports of a Great Depression out off the coast, and that, that hurricane hit August the 23rd, 1933, before we named hurricane. So it's, today it's referred to as the Great Chesapeake Potomac Hurricane. Uh, there were in part at least six to eight feet of water throughout Langley Field. Uh, a lot of that water damage is still visible in the, in the building itself today. But full scale and, uh, and also the uh, tow tank took terrible damage in that storm. Uh, the carry stone of which both were constructed uh, couldn't withstand the forces and, and winds that came up in that hurricane. Ironically, 
70 years ago, uh, 70 years later, another hurricane by the name of Isabel came up with almost identical path and it struck the area, identical to what this hurricane of 1933 did. Mr. Lewis said, get it back in operation quickly. And he did. This was, picture was taken in 1933. Uh, George Lewis had instituted a practice that was famous through the NACA called the Annual Aircraft Engineering Conference. Each year, George Lewis would personally rehearse and review the staff of Langley who would make presentations to visiting company people, dignitaries, academia, uh, anyone who was anyone in the world of aviation. Uh, and after a month of reviews, these people would be uh, boated down from the D.C. area. Uh, Lewis would meet them at night. They would have an overnight cruise to come down, land at Old Point Comfort. Next morning, Lewis personally treated the visitors, paid for their meals, their breakfast, and brought them out to Langley where they heard speeches on the latest technology. At the end of the day, it was their job to report back and say what the NACA should be working on. Now, this picture is a famous one. Uh, 1934 conference, everyone who was anyone in aviation is in this picture. Howard Hughes, Orville Wright, Charles Lindbergh, Jimmy Doolittle, Leroy Grumman, people with names like Aronka, Stearman, anyone who was anyone is in this picture and photograph. <clears throat> Just to give you a close up of a couple of these people uh, up on the front row, Howard Hughes was here to represent the Fairchild Aircraft Company. He was working for them. Uh, and, and uh, heard the briefings. Uh, Charles Lindbergh and Orville Wright were both members of the committee at that time, the, the famous Committee of Twelve. So they were here as well to listen to uh, what happened and what the NACA could, was working on at that time. Now, I want to go back to this picture because in addition to all these Who Shot John VIPs who were up here in the bleachers, you'll notice up here a conglomeration of people. Well, as you would expect, half of those people were aerodynamic people here at the NACA. But the other half, strangely, were not aerodynamicists. They were structures people. And for years, I worried about what were they doing in that picture. And uh, it's a part of, of Langley's history, which has missed the historian's bet. But at that time, the NACA, of course, was very interested in loads imposed on aircraft flying in gust and turbulence. They had begun the development of the so-called VGH recorder, which was the forerunner of today's black box. And in the confines of this huge space of the full-scale tunnel, they had a testing technique, which was quite, quite remarkable in what was accomplished. Now, this is a picture of a model that was used in these tests. And I'd like for you to notice the nose of this model has a harpoon on it. Uh, looks identical to a harpoon. And I'm going to run a movie that shows you what these people did in what was called the Langley Gust Tunnel. The idea was to fly a model through a vertically rising airstream that had been uh, tailored to represent a gust and to measure its accelerations and loads. The objective of these tests was to define design criteria for aircraft. And I'm going to run this movie now and uh, show you what those tests look like. <clears throat> this model is getting checked out prior to the test in terms of center of gravity, et cetera. And you can see here they're installing accelerometers. This is 1938, folks. Uh, it, these are the recording accelerometers to measure the air loads that the model would experience. And this was the setup. A catapulted model is flown over a vertically rising airstream. This was a squirrel cage blower. And then it would impact a rubber band screen and a burlap sack. Now you can put the harpoon together with the burlap sack. Here's a launch of the model going over the vertical rising airstream. And uh, you can see at the end of the flight, it goes through these rubber bands and into this burlap sack. Uh, and this poor technician has the job of, for the rest of the afternoon, trying to get the model out. <laughs> now that was located uh, behind the propellers beneath the air section of the tunnel. Now, what was important about the work, this was the work that was done during World War II, and what was found in many cases, we were over-designing our aircraft by almost 20% in terms of structural weight because we didn't have sufficient information on the loads imposed on the aircraft during gust. So that's what those structures people were doing uh, back in the back section of the tunnel. 
1930s, what, did, what was accomplished? Uh, the interesting part was when this wind tunnel was put into operation, George Lewis had done such a forceful job, there was no research program. Nobody had stopped long enough to think, what are we going to do with the wind tunnel when we get it built? Uh, so one of the first things they did was the obvious question. They, they uh, addressed the issue of model scale effects. Would you get the same answer with a full scale wing that you got with a subscale wing? And a, a series of wings were of different lengths, different spans were tested in the tunnel. Uh, they obtained their information. Uh, meantime, the people that were at the variable density tunnel had gone off with another direction to, to solve problems of scaling as well. Uh, the military, of course, were the very predominant customers in this facility, and, and by the way, were through the years as well. One of the first tests was this Loeing airplane. It was a uh, seaplane, which was designed to be foldable and stored on a submarine, uh, and then launched from the submarine for flight. Uh, Tests were done. This is a, a, a Lockheed airplane, similar to the one that Charles Lindbergh flew, except his had fixed landing gear. This test was to evaluate the characteristics with retractable landing gear. And Lindbergh was horrified to find that the drag, aerodynamic drag of the airplane was more than doubled by his landing gear. So the very uh, earliest test with retractable gear airplanes in terms of aerodynamic measurements were made there. And this little picture of the P-26 peace shooter, and the reason why it was in that group picture I showed earlier, it began to evaluate these wing trailing edge devices. These are called split flaps to reduce the airspeed uh, for landing of the aircraft. So these were the uh, things that were done in the 30s. And people began to say, well, uh, we've done all we need to do. Uh, is the tunnel ready to be closed? And uh, this question was asked many times during its 78-year history, but as you can imagine, things happened. In 1938, the Brewster Buffalo airplane was flight tested by the Navy. Uh, the impending war years were coming. This was the first monoplane fighter to be developed for the Navy, and it was woeful. It had a maximum speed of about 250 miles an hour in its early flight test. Uh, the Japanese Zero or the Messerschmitt 109 were up above 300 miles an hour in terms of cruise speed. And this little portly airplane was a dog. The Navy uh, quickly got this airplane and got permission from the NACA steering committee to take it to Langley and mount this airplane in the full-scale tunnel and find out what the devil was going on aerodynamically. Well, you know, this is a, this is a statement of the state of the art that we had in the United States back in the late 30s. Uh, they didn't understand the aerodynamic drag implications of having segmented canopies with big gaps between segments, uh, rivets all over the airplane, storage areas for life rafts with cutouts and hatches, and most of all, exposed landing gear. Even though it was retracted, the landing gear was exposed, and the real problem area was up here. Trying to cool these engines and yet still minimize the aerodynamic drag when you had to put real real surfaces and devices on like carburetor coolers or air coolers proved to be a real challenge for the aviation community. So the good people here at the NACA put that airplane in the wind tunnel. I have a film I want to show you of the, of the uh, airflow over this airplane. Uh, and keep in mind, please, this was a state of the art back in the 1930s. Uh, these pieces of wool that have been fixed to the airplane give some indication of the airflow, what it looks like as the airplane is tested for different conditions. You can see the big gaps in the canopy. You can see steps and cutouts, uh, big hatches, uh, areas where the aircraft was to be listed, lifted, excuse me, cutouts for the control surfaces. Uh, but up front was where the real problem was. The air coolers and cooling the airplane, here's a periscope type gun sight sticking out into the wind. Uh, and you can see how bad the front end of the airplane was. You can see that here's a wool tuft that's pointing forward. The airflow was completely reversed and coming back on the airplane. Here's a, excuse me, very uh, exaggerated flow on the airplane. Put a cap on that story. Uh, by the time the NACA and at the tunnel had done their test, there were recommendations passed on that increased the speed of this airplane by over 35 miles an hour and put it over 300 miles an hour. Uh, that work did not go unnoticed by the other military uh, activities as well. Now, in 1939, after that test was completed, the tunnel had, had been run and run and run at top speed, and fatigue problems began to come up with the dry propellers. The original propellers in this wind tunnel were cast aluminum, and 
it was found after that buffalo test that fatigue was setting in not only in the propeller blades but also in the drive motors themselves. So a change was made, a decision was made to put wooden propellers in there, stick to spruce. They, uh, the NSA couldn't find a contractor to do this job, believe it or not. So they had to go within their shops to actually construct wooden blades for the, for the tunnel. Now, these wooden blades were put into the, the uh, tunnel in 1939. They are the same blades that are in that wind tunnel today. Unbelievable that they wouldn't have been destroyed by pieces or whatever. So uh, the, the changeover took place and the military came in force. Now, this started a number of studies that were ideally suited for this and other wind tunnels here at Langley. Uh, combined studies which uh, flight tests were done on aircraft and then the same airplane was put into the wind tunnel. This picture is a view of Langley as it existed in 1939. This is the NACA flight hangar, the first flight hangar that was here at Langley. And these aircraft would be flown into the hangar, uh, flight tests would be conducted, and then they would be carted up, taken down the street over to the full-scale tunnel and mounted, same airplane for, for uh, wind tunnel testing. And they came and they came and they came, uh, application after application. During the war, there was a series of problem solving that had to be done. These were the years where people in this facility and a number of wind tunnels worked minimum 48 hour per week shifts, no vacation time. So the press was a 24 seven operation to get the aircraft and get them up in the air and get them refined and modified. Tests that were done included so-called drag cleanup test. This was an approach where every crack and crevice you saw on that old Brewster airplane uh, would be covered over and the engineers would take pieces of tape off one at a time to evaluate how much drag was coming from different parts of the airplane and give some clue as to how to improve the performance of the airplane. Uh, a number of our fighter airplanes had failures in their tail surfaces during dives or pullouts and tests were done, in this case a P-40, uh, which suffered some early tail damage during that, those type of maneuvers. Uh, other problems, engine cooling. This is a wing section from a B-24 Liberator uh, that was tested to evaluate cooling and how to improve the cooling. These airplanes were subject to in-flight fires, both the B-24 and the B-29. So that type of test was done in the facility. And then later in the war, this picture of this bought Corsair was a test done because of uh, load, excessive loads that they were encountering during carrier operations for the Corsair where the folding wings the hydraulics to, to power the wings and put them back into the flight position were incapable of overpowering the air loads during crosswinds. So there was a series of series after, uh, after this type of activity that continued on through the war years and uh, it became the place to go for any type of aer aerodynamic type improvement. There's one particular story that uh, has somehow missed history that's very important and that this center contributed to in terms of solving this problem. The P-38 uh, in 1941 was being developed as our first line fighter for Europe and the Pacific. In November of 1941, a Lockheed pilot during a flyby of the plant out in Burbank, for some reason decided to put the airplane into a high speed dive to, uh, to show off to the hometown crew. Uh, and it was catastrophic. The tail surfaces came off the airplane, it crashed, uh, the prototype was lost, and the Army was up in arms about what happened to the aircraft. The designer of the P-38 was Clarence Kelly Johnson, who designed the SR-71 that we're all familiar with today. Uh, he wanted the NACA to immediately put model of this P-38 into the eight-foot high-speed tunnel, which at that time was testing the B-29. Uh, NACA refused, but they invited Lockheed to place a P-38 into the full-scale tunnel. Now, this is a picture of the P-38 in the tunnel. People have seen this picture and said 100 miles per hour. Uh, no way could they look at something involving a high-speed dive. Well, they did. This picture, in addition to doing the drag cleanup test, if you look carefully at this airplane, the staff of the tunnel put pressure uh, instrumentation on the aircraft and they could predict from these tests where the critical speed would be on the airplane that would form shock waves. And those shock waves in turn reduce the, the uh, airflow to the extent of having separation, particularly over this intersection of the airplane, which was very bulky, uh, 
It had a very large radius leading edge, not the type of airfoil to put on a high-speed airplane. This picture was taken when the staff of Full Scale Tunnel put a high-speed airfoil on the airplane. It was a 66 series NACA airfoil, and if you look carefully, you can see that the corner of the wing has been extended. That was their way of putting the high-speed airfoil on. Also, the fuselage was modified. The canopy was reshaped to uh, delay the onset of compressibility of, uh, that was causing the problem. Now, that information was fed over to the people next door at the eight-foot high-speed tunnel, where it finally was able to be put in in February the following year. This test shows the P-38 in the eight-foot tunnel. If you look carefully, one of the first things that was done once it was recognized that this area was a problem of flow separation was to raise the tail on the P-38 to get it out of that terrible flow field. That was unacceptable to Kelly Johnson and Lockheed. So the staff here at Langley continued to work and within two months had come up with a solution to this problem. The problem turned out to be putting flaps on the other outer underwing of the P-38 to be deployed during high-speed dives that enabled the pilot to retain control and not get into this compressibility issue. This is Kelly Johnson over here on the right uh, with a Lockheed pilot showing the, one of the typical flaps that was put on the P-38. That solution was applied to other aircraft in the European theater, the P-47 Thunderbolt, other aircraft as well. But it was a, a major contribution to this lab of helping to solve what was to be a really uh, crucial problem for the P-38. Now, I want to change gears for a minute and talk a little bit about uh, some of the unusual testing that, has, that took place in the tunnel. Uh, it has had a myriad of applications, uh, starting with an albacore submarine. This is a one-fifth scale model of what was to be the, the world's fastest submarine put in the tunnel because aerodynamic drag, hydrodynamic drive, are basically quite similar in terms of some of the effects. Uh, it was studied back in the 50s. This is a, uh, a parrowing vehicle that was tested in the tunnel. Uh, anyone who goes to Nags Head knows what I'm talking about now. The, uh, the facility worked a good decade on Francis Regalo's concept for flexible wings, for applications for utility vehicles such as this, and also for spacecraft. Uh, the people in the space program were quite relieved when it was decided after the Gemini program we wouldn't put this thing on a spacecraft. There was a better way, which ultimately became the shuttle. But nonetheless, that, that concept was worked quite hard in the facility. Uh, down here was a picture I had to put in. Uh, because the test engineer, engineer Clyde McLemore is with us today. This is an idea that Goodyear had back in the 60s during the, the Vietnam War for an inflatable airplane. And the idea was that a downed pilot could, be, could have delivered to him an aircraft which could be inflated with something on the order of bicycle tire pressure, uh, have a, a small engine available, and he could simply fly himself away instead of having to be waited for rescue behind enemy lines. Uh, it was tested in the facility to explore the, the uh, amount of loads that could be taken by the structure, and it was intentionally uh, tested to catastrophic failure in the tunnel. Nonetheless, several of these were made, flown quite successfully, and one exists today uh, still in the museum. But it was a quite successful uh, experience. Over on the right, uh, lower picture, it was the brainchild of Charles Zimmerman, a brilliant, brilliant NACA engineer who worked here. And his quest in life was to develop an aircraft which had extremely slow landing speeds and could land a very confined area. Uh, as you can see, this was perhaps the first flying saucer. His idea was a circular wing which would be bathed in the uh, slipstream of very large propellers and thereby could approach at very low speeds, almost like a parachute, and land in a small area. The Navy, of course, was very interested in this in terms of carrier operations and encouraged testing of a prototype. This was a flying prototype version of what would be proposed to be a high-speed fighter. It was tested in the full-scale wind tunnel. It was flown by a number of people, including Charles Lindbergh, who, uh, who were quite emphatic about how good this airplane was. And it was to be developed into a high-speed fighter during the war years as a solution to the kamikaze problem we were having in the Pacific. The idea was to place this type of an airplane on small carriers and operate from them. So. Uh, Again, just very unusual tests that were done in the facility. When NASA was formed, uh, this facility changed and began to, to support space age activities. The picture on the upper left 
is a mercury capsule undergoing aerodynamic test. Uh, ladies, these types of bodies don't like to fly very well with par without parachutes or things attached. So one of the major thrusts was to find out how unstable these things would be during re-entry into the atmosphere and uh, what it took to stabilize them during re-entry. Now, I had mentioned earlier that space under the uh, air passages of the full-scale tunnel. Uh, this, under the, under the return propellers, a special room was built when Project Mercury uh, realized they had a real problem on their hand, and that was, how do you communicate with an astronaut flying around the world? Uh, where do we need to put the people for communications? And more importantly, what about emergency procedures and, uh, and what our language will be? Uh, Christopher Kraft, uh, director of uh, Mercury Control, uh, had this room built in the full-scale tunnel, and in it, the Link Company, who made flight simulators in World War II, made a capsule simulator. This shows John Glenn uh, in a pre-flight simulation. Uh, and, and in here, all of the original seven astronauts were uh, given training in terms of procedure, communications, et cetera. Uh, one of the most notable contributions and most valuable contributions of NACA and NASA to Project Mercury was this, this particular simulator. As the space program moved along and moved away from capsules, the tunnel became involved in testing so-called lifting bodies. This was the HL-10, which was a Langley design. Uh, and with fixed wings gave some degree of flexibility to how re-entering uh, astronauts might be able to broaden their footprint to land in other areas. And of course, the evolution of that work led to the space shuttle today. This test uh, at the bottom right uh, was remarkable. This was a wind tunnel test basically on a, on a conglomeration of tubes and bars. This was a so-called lunar landing training vehicle, which was used to train the astronauts uh, Neil Armstrong and others before their moon landing. It had a vertically oriented jet engine in this structure and which would bear five, six of the uh, vehicle's weight. And it was flown extensively for training. The astronauts liked what was here at Langley in terms of our lunar landing facility, but they loved this one because it gave complete freedom and in Neil Armstrong's view, a more realistic uh, perspective of moon landing. The aircraft encountered an accident, which was near fatal in, in Houston during training uh, in December of 1968. This vehicle, or replacement vehicle, was flown into the full-scale tunnel for testing in early 1969, and the cause of that crash was identified in the testing. Uh, the vehicle was modified and put back into operation. Neil Armstrong was able to fly twice before his foray to the moon later. <clears throat> An event happened in the 1950s that changed the purpose and life of Full Scale Tunnel. Uh, a group that had previously been doing free-flying model work in a small wind tunnel uh, began to lust after the full, large uh, space available in the Full Scale Tunnel to fly models in. In the, with the beginning of the Space Task Group and Project Mercury, the project schedule at full scale began to allow them to do some exploratory testing of free-flying models. Their role in life was to look at stability and control of, of vehicles. And this shows a typical flight test that was done. This was back in 1957, where they, they managed to get into the tunnel for a brief time and evaluate the stability of a hypersonic boosted re-entry vehicle. This was 1957, okay? Sputnik and everything came after. So Langley and NASA, NACA were not sitting on their hands before Sputnik flew. Uh, this shows the crew on, a, on the balcony that those people were on in the earlier picture from 1934. And the testing technique consisted of a, uh, basically a compressed air powered model. This tube you could see coming in the top of the model supplied compressed air with flexible tubing and also signals from the controls from pilots that were located in the facility. The pilots would sit on this balcony uh, and control, and the fellow that compared, controlled the uh, level of compressed air was also there to, to control the thrust. A third person was situated on the ground plane of the facility, looking up at the rear end of the model, where he could control the rolling and yawing, the side-to-side -side motions of the model. And uh, finally, a part of this cable was actually steel aircraft cable which passed through a pulley at the top of the test section and then over to the side of the tunnel. And an individual was there to manually pull this model out of the wind tunnel if it went out of control. Now, I think about 
OSHA regulations and how we'd ever do a job like this today, but that's the way things got started. And I'd like to show you a clip that shows what these people were looking for. In this case, it was what will these vehicles fly like as they re-enter at hypersonic speeds. The scenes you're going to see are the first scene shows this model in flight at a relatively low angle of attack. The second scene is going to show what happened if the pilot would increase the angle of attack and encounter these unstable rolling oscillations. By the way, you see a second model mounted in testing in the tunnel. That was a unique feature of this wind tunnel where you could fly models in the daytime and shift them and test another model at nighttime. It's one of the few wind tunnels that had could test two different models at the same time. So that was an idea of some of the uh, dynamic stability work that had happened during that activity. In modern times, we upgraded the, the testing technique uh, considerably. Uh, the addition, here's the cutaway showing the test crew in the balcony. It was enclosed. A high-speed uh, winch was used for safety cable operations. You can see the uh, roll and yaw pilot in the exit cone of the tunnel in a special room there. But the big to-do was we added a flight control computer. And the expertise of the staff in the tunnel, we were able to simulate the advanced controls used on modern high-performance airplanes, fighters or advanced uh, aircraft. I want to show a, a quick clip of a typical flight test that, we, uh, that we've recently done with this blended wing body configuration. A point to be made, this test ap application was done for two primary purposes, either unusual um, advanced shapes for which there was no database available, this being a good case, or for a conventional airplane trying to fly in a flight condition that was not amenable to other means of analysis. A good example, aircraft flying at high angles of attack with separated airflow, which simply cannot be predicted with using computer technology. This one had to do with an advanced configuration, and it gives you a good perspective on how these tests were conducted, the relative size of the models, uh, and what a typical flight test looks like. This is the Boeing. NASA Air Force cooperative blended wing body test. You can see the pilots here flying the model uh, in the tunnel and see how a typical flight test is done. This is today's headlines. This is one of the most recent uh, uh, innovative configurations that NASA is pursuing al and along with Boeing. So that shows what we did in terms of current testing in the facility. Uh, we devoted quite a bit of time in the early 80s to general aviation. Uh, the military push had kind of passed us over, and we had some time to go back and look at general aviation. Back in 1935, an important test was done in this wind tunnel when Fred Wyke, who was an NACA researcher in charge of the propeller research tunnel, uh, challenged his staff to come up with a, quote, safe airplane design. Uh, and they had lunch, built a, an airplane in Wyke's garage, uh, the Department of Commerce, who was trying to inspire the, the growth of aviation, actually bought the airplane and asked NACA to mount it in this wind tunnel and test it. It was unique in terms of the ease of control. It also had some features in it that were remarkable for the time. Tricycle landing gear. This was the first aircraft to have tricycle landing gear. And it was emulated and copied for future aircraft, military and civil as well. In the 1960s, we did quite a bit of work as part of a general NASA investigation on handling qualities of general aviation aircraft. Uh, and this twin Comanche airplane was tested extensively in full scale. Uh, in the 80s, uh, Bert Rutan was one of the, the many visitors to the tunnel. And uh, we did a cooperative job looking at his Rutan, very easy design, because it had such safe characteristics uh, because of the canard design, tail first design. And we learned quite a bit of, about the airplane as well as, uh, as BERT. So those operations continued uh, into the late 60s and, and even into the 90s. Uh, one of our uh, passions is the development of a high-speed civil transport, uh, as yet blocked by sonic boom, uh, noise, and other problems that, that uh, come forth from such airplanes. But the real problem that we ran into in the SST from the full-scale tunnel perspective, although these airplanes were very efficient supersonically, they had some real problems at low speeds for landing and takeoff. They were very difficult to control and, frankly, in many cases, couldn't produce enough lift to land the airplane at a safe speed. This is some of the activity 
the tunnel was a participant in the first US SST program. This shows the Boeing variable sweep aircraft, uh, which they had proposed at that time. Uh, that airplane turned out to be uh, uh, fairly much of a dog in terms of its performance. The people here at NASA, uh, using computer technology and high-speed testing, had advanced a competitive design for consideration called the SCAT-15. And it is still today the most efficient supersonic design that anyone has come up with. However, at low speeds, it had major problems. More wind tunnel time was spent in the full-scale tunnel and low-speed facilities trying to cure the low-speed problems on this airplane than actually were expended at supersonic speeds. Uh, NASA continued to pursue this goal of a high-speed transport into the 90s. Uh, this beautiful picture shows a test underway in the full scale, uh, again, looking at low-speed characteristics and takeoff and landing characteristics for a McDonnell Douglas design. In the 1960s, uh, vertical takeoff and landing became a, a goal of the military. Uh, after the war, the issue of Europe and the safety of runways and the ability to operate military aircraft became paramount, and a huge number of ideas of how to have aircraft take off and land in a small uh, runway area were pursued. The earlier test had to do with so-called tail sitter airplanes, and uh, the concept was simple, putting a, an airplane vertically, uh, operating it, letting it take off vertical as a helicopter, and then perform a maneuver where the airplane tilted over and became a high-speed aircraft for flight. Worked well. Uh, pilots were able to do this. Unfortunately, trying to land an aircraft like this vertically while on your back turned out to be much too much of a task. Uh, so early on, it was decided vertical uh, attitude airplanes were not the way to go. So a number of other horizontal attitude concepts were pursued, including the idea of tilting wings, uh, extensive work done in terms of full-scale aircraft and flight tests here at Langley and in the full-scale tunnel, and a paramount activity done, uh, very critical in the 1960s, in which Langley cooperated with Hawker Sidley to develop the so-called P-1127, which was an aircraft that had movable nozzles located and could be rotated for vertical takeoff and then rotated rearward for conventional flight. Uh, that airplane program was, was terribly underfunded, met major funding difficulties, which only the British government could resolve. And a cooperative activity which brought the British to the full-scale tunnel and involved free flight model testing to prove that the concept worked was a major input to that program. The movie film of this airplane, this model flying in full scale, was immediately taken to Parliament and Observing those movies, Parliament okayed monies to continue this program. Well, the rest, as you know, has developed into the uh, jump jet flown, the Harrier, flown by the uh, Marine Corps today. So the legacy of this program uh, so many years ago built into the U.S. evolvement of the Harrier for the Marine Corps. The lower right was kind of the end game in terms of vertical takeoff. It became realized that there were too many penalties to be paid with vertical takeoff airplanes in terms of weight, uh, excess uh, thrust, et cetera. And another concept was explored. Now, the gentleman on the left is John P. Campbell, the late Campbell, uh, who had the idea of tilting the engine nacelles nose down on transport aircraft, such that the exhaust from these engines would blow over these large trailing edge flaps on the wing and induce higher lift for lower landing speeds and operating out of shorter uh, runway conditions. He came up with the idea in the 1950s, uh, and it worked well in the wind tunnel. Oh, there was only one unfortunate problem. The engines in vogue at that time were turbojet engines, which had very hot exhaust, and frankly, no aircraft structure was going to be able to tolerate that concept. Well, turbofan engines were then developed with cool exhaust, and as happened so much in research, the, a, a concept which suddenly comes on the scene was able to bring forth something that, in fact, had been thought of years ago. Uh, the full-scale wind tunnel was the center hub of the development of this concept, and as many of you know, this was applied to the current Air Force C-17 transport. Uh, if you've been to Langley for an air show and see the real eye-watering takeoff and landing capability of the C-17, the entire capability is due to the tests that were done in the full-scale wind tunnel. <clears throat> in the 1960s, during the Vietnam era, an event happened that, that again shaped the use of the wind tunnel. 
In the 1950s, in Korean War, the U.S. had developed the F-86 Sabre fighter airplane. It was exquisite. It was maneuverable. Uh, it was so maneuverable that it took advantage of deficiencies in the Soviet-designed MiG-15. And in fact, at one time in that war, over 30% of the kills that were afforded from the Sabre jet pilots were afforded by getting a MiG-15 into a tight dogfight, a tight turn, and the aerodynamic properties of that airplane were so bad the aircraft would spin out of control and without the Sabre pilot ever firing a shot. Unfortunately, in the late 1950s, after the Korean War, our military adopted the position that we don't need to dogfight anymore. We're going to put our faith in missiles, and our airplanes will be missile launchers. We'll never have to see the enemy. We'll simply launch a missile and kill him without ever getting close. So we developed an entire fleet of different aircraft that had to be used during the Vietnam War who were missile launchers. The epitome of problems that we had in that era was the number of losses that were suffered during training and actual combat because our airplanes were the ones suffering from stability and control problems. The main part of that story was the F-4 Phantom, uh, an aircraft to be a missile launcher. During its service in and training for Vietnam, the Air Force and the Navy combined lost 136 of these airplanes due to deficient handling characteristics during tight turns and maneuvers. Uh, it became an area of flight to be avoided in the F-4. And I have a film sequence here I want to show you that shows what the pilots were up against. Now, I'm going to show you a, an actual test that was done out at Edwards by the Air Force in which a test pilot is flying this aircraft and knows what is about to happen to him during a tight turn. You're looking at the airplane from a very powerful ground tracking telescope. He's flying up at 30,000 feet. And what he's doing is... He's going to turn the airplane, and you get an awkward perspective because of that ground-mounted camera, but he'll turn the airplane and begin to pull G's and, and tighten the turn of the airplane. And although he's fully prepared for what ensued, you can see that as the airplane tightens the turn, he suddenly loses control. The airplane immediately goes into a spin, which tightens as he is unable to recover the airplane. Now, this test airplane, and it was a test, actually could not be controlled. He deployed a parachute to try and recover the airplane, which left the airplane, and this airplane crashed. The crew had ejected safely, but it gives you a perspective on how violent these maneuvers were and why we were losing so many airplanes. In 1969, the Air Force came to Langley and said, you need to help us. We don't have any aerodynamic information on this series of airplanes at high angles of attack. Full Scale Tunnel became the hub of a national program to improve our fighter aircraft. A uh, picture at the top left shows the modification that was arrived at after test in the 7 by 10 foot high speed tunnel and the Full Scale Tunnel, which leading edge devices were put on the F-4 and it completely eliminated the problem with this airplane for high angles of attack. Uh, we didn't lose any aircraft once we put these things on the airplane. Uh, Seeing that type of success and correlation that we had with the, the real world, the Air Force and Navy immediately lined up at the door and virtually every high maneuver aircraft developed for the services went through full-scale wind tunnel with this type of testing to evaluate their characteristics all the way through the current uh, Navy and Air Force aircraft. So those tests were done. I might also add that research aircraft were added to, to ensure that uh, their characteristics were satisfactory. But every aircraft for the next 30 years went through full-scale tunnel for that testing. We ended up with a fleet of military aircraft like the F-15, which could do gee whiz maneuvers at air shows. When you out, go out to Langley and see an airplane pitched up to a high attitude flying by very slowly, it certainly has great stability. But the issue remained about how to get maneuverability out of the airplane. And the people here at the 16-foot transonic tunnel had developed a concept called thrust vectoring. And it basically consisted of movable, rotatable nozzles on the back end of the airplane, which might provide uh, a better signature for the aircraft in terms of radar or infrared signature. And we, in the high angle of attack business, really saw an application for controllability of aircraft during maneuvers. I want to show a segment here of a free flight test. This is of a a modified F-16, which 
NASA cooperatively uh, designed with the people uh, at General Dynamics to give the F-16 a supersonic capability based on our uh, supersonic transport experience. Uh, over at the full-scale tunnel, we applied thrust vectoring to this airplane, and this will show you a demonstration of how powerful uh, thrust vectoring was to control this aircraft. Uh, they'll move the model around for a minute to show you these simple little veins that we put in the uh, exhaust system of the, uh, of the simple model, again, powered with compressed air, but having movable veins to redirect the direction of the thrust coming out of this airplane. Here, this is a pitch control to give nose up and down control, and we also implemented side-to-side -side vectoring of the thrust to give you yaw control. Uh, and this provided an unprecedented level of controllability of high-performance aircraft for high-angle of attack conditions. Here's a flight sequence, first showing the airplane flying with thrust vectoring off. You'll notice when he gets up to about a 20-degree angle of attack, the pilot loses control because he doesn't have effective pitch control. Wow. And here's a shot with the thrust vectoring engaged. You can see the airplane is flying at that same condition, perfectly under control, uh, with no problems whatsoever. And in fact, the control was so powerful, we're flying it at twice that angle of attack now, up to 40 degrees angle of attack. Uh, and we continued to push on with our, our application of vector. Uh, not only did we fly it at twice the angle of attack, here's three times the angle of attack. So it's flying at 60 degrees under control with no tendency to depart or go into a spin. Uh, this was a powerful, powerful concept. Uh, of course, our friends across the way took note of what that concept did. Uh, this center, particularly the people at the 16-foot tunnel, uh, should be uh, given the accolades for developing the thrust vectoring, which now has been employed for the F-22. Uh, show, this shows the back end of the airplane, which has pitch vectoring, and its exhaust can be rotated for extreme controllability of the aircraft. The uh, tunnel continued to soldier on into the 90s. Uh, two things happened. One was the Cold War ended. Uh, so the military activities began to wane down. The second was the industry mergers uh, ended up with fewer people with innovative ideas to be tested in the full-scale wind tunnel. But the third and most important thing that happened was, despite having survived hurricanes, there was a hurricane that had happened in 1993 with a new NASA administrator by the name of Dan Golden. Uh, Mr. Golden wanted change. He wanted change in the culture and the organization and his facilities. And one of the decisions that was made was to close this oldest NASA wind tunnel. Uh, in 1995, NASA formally closed the full-scale wind tunnel. Uh, ceremony there, uh, a lot of tears, a lot of closing, of, a lot, lot of emotion over the closing of the facility, but it was closed in 1995. Uh, following that time period, Old Dominion University uh, leased the tunnel and, and its applications for the facility uh, through, through this year involved ground transportation testing, uh, doing computational correlation with those testing, motorsports, uh, DOD testing, and keeping the, the facility alive to the point where NASA could do tests such as that blended wing body uh, flight test that I mentioned earlier. The last test done in the tunnel happened a few weeks ago. This was a follow-on testing of the X-48C, uh, and the tunnel has since closed its doors. The tunnel in 1985 was recognized along with other facilities here at Langley as a historic landmark. Uh, Full-scale tunnel, the variable density tunnel I mentioned earlier, which is uh, on the grounds here. Langley's lunar landing research facility, the gantry, and the rendezvous and docking simulator, which was so pertinent to the Gemini program uh, and early space ventures. Uh, the three wind tunnels at the top are now closed uh, and, uh, and continue to uh, be recognized in history. After 78 years of service, uh, our princess became old. Uh, the mascara and lipstick makeup is gone. Uh, the facility is as you see it today uh, with rust and exterior wear uh, and be in a position now to be recognized in history for its contributions. I want to talk about the personnel of this wind tunnel. This is the 
unique situation of having no less than four NACA NASA center directors come from that facility. Smith de France, the, the fellow who designed the tunnel, uh, left Langley in 1940 and was directed to be the uh, brains behind the formation of the NASA Ames Research Center. Abe Silverstein, who was directed to become the, the NASA Lewis uh, director in Cleveland. And Harry Gett, who was on the staff, became the first director of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Delma Freeman, who's here today uh, and worked with me in the 1960s in full-scale tunnel, became the director of Langley in 2002. So you know, there, there are no other wind tunnels or organizations that provided four future center directors uh, for the agency. This is a list of the branch heads that have uh, run the tunnel through the years from 31 through 95, through the NASA years. And the point that I wanted to make on this, on this uh, chart, when we named Dana Dunham to be the head of that wind tunnel in the late 90s, she became the first female head of a wind tunnel branch at Langley, another first for the facility. I want to briefly talk about the staffs that work the facility. I showed you this photograph of the first staff. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a very important gentleman who worked in the full-scale wind tunnel. Uh, he's down here in the lower left, looking up at the so-called Zimmer skimmer that we talked about earlier. Uh, Jack Reeder came to the full-scale wind tunnel in 1938 with a desire to become a pilot. And in those years, simply, there was no pilot positions available. Uh, finally, in 1942, Jack transferred to flight research became world-renowned as one of the outstanding test pilots and managers of flight research ever in the, aviation, in the hit annals of aviation history. And I think the, the, the greatest accolade I've heard paid to Jack was Neil Armstrong, who was one of Jack's favorites, referred to him as the best, the best test pilot I've ever known, which is a real tribute to a real gentleman. This is a staff from 1946. Uh, as it Went through the years, uh, the organizational uh, demands of the facility and structure changed so that other tasks were taken. People were not only running the wind tunnel, but they were doing other jobs like using simulators or doing theoretical work. So in these pictures, not everybody ran the wind tunnel. Uh, they weren't all in the wind tunnel. This picture in 94, uh, I wanted to make a point. When we ran the full-scale wind tunnel, the Langley Apprentice and Co-op programs were very big in our planning. We needed that manpower, that additional help, and the students that were assigned to full-scale tunnel uh, considered it to be the creme de la creme. This was a competitive position to be assigned to when you came to Langley. So we had quite a few uh, co-op students and a huge educational tie to the uh, academic community during the operation that we ran over at Full Scale Tunnel. I want to make a point to everyone who worked in Full Scale Tunnel that the center is currently involved in a major archiving activity uh, to save material, photographs, documents, et cetera, so that they will be available for future generations. The history of the Full Scale Tunnel and, and other major facilities here at Langley are being made available on public demand. There are photographs available. The tunnel test log is available. Uh, and also virtual tour where you can look at the wind tunnel from the inside and see scenes. Uh, recognizing the world is what it is today. We're even posting movies of the tunnel on YouTube so you can go and see some of the testing that you were involved in. The technical reports are available on the NASA technical uh, report series. When you go to these sites, you'll see a page for each of the major NASA facilities. This one shows a full-scale tunnel. And you can see by clicking on any of these, you can get the history, the photos, the film clips, the tours, and interviews of people that work there. And by the way, today, we would like to interview those people that would like to say a few words about their career over at Full Scale. Uh, if you're not a computer literate person, go to your library. Ask the librarian to put you online and reach these sites. Uh, you'll enjoy seeing your history retold. My last chart is just a reflection uh, of all the history that happened in this wind tunnel. Uh, much of it has been overlooked. Much of it is still enjoyed. At one point, uh, the magazines and articles you read referred to this as the Langley Wind Tunnel. So 
it will never be erased from history. And the next time you're at an air show and you see a flyby of heritage flight, realize that every one of these airplanes from World War II on was touched by people that worked the full-scale tunnel. I want to close with one last thought. There has been one individual who, in my research, has been outstanding in terms of devotion to the full-scale tunnel, spent more time in that wind tunnel than anyone else in history, uh, worked there for 33 years as a research engineer, and has continued on for 14 more years as a consultant and knows more about that place than anybody else. I'd like Sue Grafman to stand up and be recognized. I've probably used up more time than I should, but uh, I wanted particularly the old timers to know that, that their accomplishments will never be forgotten, forgotten, and as long as I can continue, <laughs> as long as I can continue to put things on pages, uh, no one will forget. Thank you very much for your attention.